So there's a saying that says that uh, when you go black, you never go back. What do you think about that? Yes, it's um, a very true to the point where I believe um, that maybe some um, witchcraft was used. Because why is it <laughs> that I can't leave this woman? <laughs> Whereas I joke about uh, a witchcraft. What I mean by saying this is uh, not that there's anything put in my food, although I wonder sometimes, but um, I just think just... <laughs> Germany, I go to Berlin, I'm friends with, with, with Isaac Sapetu, he's a great guy. Now Germany, I'm going there to get the fuvu yamangi meli be returned. Okay, so what's happened there? Yeah, during the German colonial period, the Germans mm, killed uh, one of the rebel leaders and his name was Mangi Meli and they took his skull to Germany and put it in a, um, in a museum. Mm. And he's a Chaga guy, a very old man who's the grandson of this guy and he wants compensation. He wants the, the, the skull back and compensation. But the problem is it's hard for him to go to Germany. It's not hard for me to go to Germany. So I'm going to meet... You know, usually as Tanzanians, when we see someone of different colors speaking Swahili, we're quite amazed. And we usually wonder, how do they learn Swahili? And why are they speaking Swahili? I don't know, for some reason, for me personally, when I see someone else speaking Swahili, I'm like, oh, wow. For example, I've once been in another country with someone and speaking Swahili. And it was, it was in the UK, speaking Swahili. And I see someone, of, someone British speaking Swahili too. I was like, oh, me monyena, I'm Swahili. So I was like, oh, wow. Like, you start feeling some sort of joy. Now... Today, we are, I'm here with my brother Musa, and today we're joined with a very special guest, and I'm sure when he's introduced, everyone will know him, because he's famously known for speaking Swahili, for being an ambassador here in Tanzania, for kutua uh, kalisha in other countries. Um, Musa. When you say everyone knows him, it's real, because as you know, yesterday we picked him up from the airport, and we got a lot of favors on the way, on the road, just because of him, you know. On the traffic, we were not staying on the traffic. He just opened the window and said, just by looking, people know it's him, it's Bongo Zozo. So, you know, he started his journey on social media. What social media can do, it's amazing. But let's not waste more time. Just like, smash that subscribe button and let's get right into it. We have Nick Reynolds here, famous known as Bongo Zozo. So let him introduce himself. Hey brother, how are you doing? I'm very good, thank you very much. Let's not start with the English. For, for the people that uh, don't know, for the viewers that don't know you, let's let them hear what you're famously known for. Ah, Navionge Kiswaili, eh? But kile kikuku kiko hakuka. I hear that. Julia, ya kuvinga kidogo na Kiswaili. Au, mimi Kiswaili ni, yani Kiswaili ni lugha ambayo unajifunza kila siku. Unaongeza kila siku, napenda methali. Hata methali moja ni jifunza juzi juu kenge, kusikia kwa kenge hadidam puani. Hehe, ina mana gani yo? Ina mana gani? I don't know. You know, you know, okay, so that in English means to feel like a, or to sense like a monitor lizard until blood pours from his nose. If you throw a stone at a monitor lizard, it doesn't move, yeah? So that's the meaning of the, the uh, proverb, is that you should listen to the warnings that are around you before they hurt you. There you go. That's an example. Bas, hi, Kiswahili icho apa. Turi kwenye kingereza. Now, we've spoken Swahili, and behind the cameras I asked you how long it took you to learn Swahili. You said three months. Three months, yeah. And so our first question here today is, um, what initially inspired you to speak Swahili and how did this journey begin for you? The women, the woman, the woman, women, yeah. I was in Iringa, I was 21, I was single. Tanzanian women are beautiful, I can't tell you. It's just unbelievably, and you know, coming from England where we're not used to such a nice uh, shape. Yeah, so uh, I, uh, well, fortunately, the woman I'm talking about, I actually married, so I've done, done, done nothing wrong there. Yeah. But um, when we met, um, she wasn't speaking much English, and I wanted to learn Swahili. Um, so we started speaking Swahili, and I made it a point to learn quickly. It was very easy to learn quickly, because as a, as a white man learning an African language, you get a lot of um, support when you say a few words, you know, and there's a few words you can learn that make people laugh. 
and so you say this word, it makes everyone laugh, and they congratulate you. I'm learning French at the moment because I'm going to Côte d'Ivoire for AFCON. I, I spend time in Senegal and Cameroon. My French is really bad. I've been learning it for 30 years, and my French is terrible. Because when I'm saying something in French, I won't make anyone laugh. And nobody will say, wow, your French is good. Because I, you know, I do not speak French. Are you French? Are you not French? But when you're speaking Swahili, what you're doing, you're showing an effort to love the country and love the culture. You can't learn Swahili without learning the culture. There's so much culture involved in the language. So that's why you say, you said at the beginning of this podcast, when, when Tanzanian people see foreigners learning Swahili, why they're happy is because they're saying, oh, this person wants to come to this country with love. They want to come and experience the fullness of our culture and our people. They're not just coming here. Traditionally, white, white people came, came to Africa to exploit, to take the resources. People in Africa can be wary of white people. I'm wary of white people in Africa. Yeah? You start speaking a language, he says, okay, well, you, you've come with the motivation to love this place. And of course, Tanzania is the most welcoming people in the world. And I've been to many countries, and the welcome is open arms. If you're going to learn Swahili, Karibu, welcome to our country. You said you started learning Swahili because of you like Tanzanian women. And behind the camera, we're talking, you said you, you are married to a Tanzanian woman. So there's a saying that says that uh, when you go black, you never go back. What do you think about that? Yes, it's um, a very true to the point where I believe. Um, that maybe some um, witchcraft was used. Because why is it <laughs> that I can't leave this woman? You know, we've been together in, in a variety of capacities for the last 24 years. And um, whereas I joke about uh, a witchcraft, what I mean by saying this is uh, not that there's anything put in my food, although I wonder sometimes, but um, I just think just... Being with an African woman when you're, when you're a white man, you get a completely different experience. So the experience uh, in Europe uh, of a European relationship is a very, I suppose, a very balanced, equal, both, both parties work, which is fine. I believe in equality, yeah? And women have equal rights to men, 100%. But sometimes it's nice when, when you get cooked for, eh? It's just really nice when, when and, and Tanzanian women especially know how to cook. Mama Jessica, that's my mother of my children. Uh, she knows how to cook very well. And it's just sometimes it's nice to feel like a hunter. Yeah? In the old days, us men used to go hunting. Yeah? And then we come back and then the, the, our, our women are home. Now, that's a very traditional view. Mm. And once again... I, I emphasize the fact that, no, if, if, you, if, if Mama Jessica, for example, does work, actually, and when I come home, no, I'm actually cooking for her, I understand. But at the heart of an African-European relationship seems to be this beautiful balance of uh, new and old. Yeah? It's, uh, and, of course, the children that you get are beautiful. There's nothing like the children from an African and European marriage. And, in fact, there's a DNA reason for it um, because... If you look at when, when, when you have children with very close relatives, yeah, those children can, can be deformed uh, sometimes. So what hum humanity has done to succeed is it's, it, it likes to join um, DNA from very f different regions. Yeah? So that my children have DNA from Europe and from Africa, which is uh, joined to create super kids. Actually, my kids are super kids. All these mixed race kids are indeed super kids because they're drawing from different uh, strands of DNA. It's a belief of mine. Now, there's a, you talked about three months you learned fluent Swahili. What was the process like? But also, were there any challenges you were facing when you were learning Swahili? Uh, no, there weren't, weren't challenges. Look, um, I'm quite a competitive person. And um, when I was in Iringa, I was, there were was some, some friends there, British friends like me, uh, who were you know, attracted to Tanzanian women. So we had, uh, we all had Tanzanian girlfriends. I'm friends with them up till today. And in those days, we were all learning Swahili, so I'm quite competitive. I wanted to learn more. Uh, learning a language is, is putting hours in. You just sit there for hours writing out words. There was a time I locked myself in a room. You write a word on a flashcard and you stick it on the wall, yeah? 
and you're just sticking your walls completely covered with these flashcards. And then you get someone to lock you in that room for five hours. You go a bit mad, you're just looking at these words, learning these words. Five hours later, you're coming out with a knowledge of, of vocabulary. I always found that because um, in Tanzania, uh, people like to talk, people like to converse, they, they like to sit on the sides of the road drinking coffee and talking. Yeah? It's a huge difference from learning English. Because if you're learning English, you're learning in books, you're learning on TV. You're not learning in conversation. Whereas Swahili was conversation. So I realized if I learn the words, then I can learn the grammar through conversation. So there has been no challenges to me learning Swahili at all. It's very, very easy to learn. You just got to put the hours in like anything. I previously tried to learn Turkish for one year, but I couldn't be as fluent as you are in Swahili, which, by the way, you learned it in three months. So what are the tips, like your best takeaways for someone who wants to learn a new language? Yes, so were you in Turkey? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, you're in Turkey. Did you have a Turkish girlfriend? No, not really. That's your issue. That's your issue. <laughs> if you see, if you were speaking fluent Turkish now, your wife or girlfriend would not be happy with you because you would be caught in the act of cheating. Because if you suddenly see that I'm speaking uh, fluent Chinese, understand that I have a Chinese girlfriend, right? Which is my plan, actually. I want to learn all languages of the world, so bring me women from different countries so I can learn the language. It's, it's you know, for the uh, development of international linguistics, bring me women. I guess, Musa, same goes to me. I tried to learn Arabic, I tried to learn Turkish. Yeah. I mean, that's the tip. Arabic. If I wanted to learn Arabic, I'd go to Oman. I've been to Oman before. It's a beautiful country. Beautiful country, beautiful people. They feed you. They feed you so much food there. But I'd say, please find me a... Um, in Oman, you can't get a girlfriend. You have to get a wife. I'd just marry there. I'd say, look, let's get a marriage for until I learn the language. Three months later, I'd say, sorry, man. <laughs> Job done. <laughs> now, you're fluent Swahili. And uh, also, when we started the episode, I talked about how you have been able to do a lot of different stuff. I mean, sorry, it was behind the camera. I was telling you, you've been able to see the ministers. You've been able to connect with different people through the, learning the language. You are the ambassador for the fo national football team. So what professional opportunities do you think, like what, open, what doors has it opened for you ever since you've learned Swahili? Well, that is something I'm learning all the time. You see, with me, I don't believe in uh, short-term gains, right? I'm a long-term person. So, for example, let me give you a metaphor. I uh, like to plant um, ebony seeds yeah, rather than sun sunflower seeds. If you plant sunflower seeds, your sunflowers will grow, grow very quickly, but the wind comes and blows them over. Yeah? I prefer ebony trees, which take 20, 30 years to grow, but then you have something solid and you have something worthwhile. Um, at the moment, I'm enjoying connections, making connections with, like you say, ministers and um, uh, ex-presidents. I had the um, pleasure of meeting um, honorable ex-president, former president, sorry, uh, doc Dr. Kikwete, Dr. Mwini, Dr. Mwini, the father of, of the current Dr. Mwini in uh, Zanzibar. And I'm sure I'm, I, they're lining me up to meet uh, the current president, Mama Samia. It's an honor and a privilege to meet these people. I'm not going into these meetings looking for opportunity. And I think that's the best thing to do. You know, they say the best time to get a girlfriend or a wife or a relationship is when you're not looking. Yeah, yeah. It just comes and bites you. See, that's the thing. I think where, if I was meeting all these people looking for opportunity, it becomes apparent. You know, he's just looking for opportunity. I'm actually one looking for uh, new experiences. I'm a new experiences guy. I'm a traveler. I like to, to have new experiences. Even this podcast here, this is an exciting experience for me. I'm not looking for anything from it, but things will come. Mm -hmm. So just to take away from that, you talked about the opportunities. So what's, for example, for someone who's watching, and you talked about how you shouldn't be chasing opportunities mm. rather than mm. wait for them, mm. for example. Mm. But uh, let's say, for example, I'm at home and I'm not doing anything. Would the opportunities come to me? No, or they won't. No. Am I supposed no, to do the basic things and then 
the opportunity to come to no, you. No, you need to volunteer. The secret is volunteering. Yeah, and so that's what I've been doing all the time. I, I, I go and could you tole, yani could volunteer. When I was in, in um, Asia, I went to Asia and I met up with the Tanzanians and I, I interviewed them. Every single one of them were volunteers in some capacity. I said, how did you come to Taiwan? Oh, we were volunteering in some kind of program in Dar es Salaam. Mm. Yeah. When you, and, and so for me, whenever I was at school as a kid, the teacher would say, say can I have a volunteer? I would put my hand up without knowing what the task was. And sometimes you get a bad task. Most of the time you don't. Most of the time you get an, a chance to learn something new. I'm just ready to volunteer. So you don't sit at home, you leave home and you go and do things for free. Everyone's too obsessed with need, needing to get paid for stuff. Ah, just go and do it for free. You'll be okay. Yeah. So we talked about how you promote the national team, Tanzania, Taifa Stars. Uh, so what does promoting this team, essentially basically promoting the whole country, and how do you approach this type of responsibilities? I believe you were given this task to make sure you, you promote it well. I mean, we were at breakfast, we talked about promoting this country so that we are going to uh, Cote d'Ivoire, we're going to Ivory Coast uh, next year. Mm -hmm. So how do you approach this type of responsibility and through speaking a whole different language? Because I'm sure even when you Ivory Coast, people say, Bongo Zozo, Nongek Swahili, people be like, where did they find this guy from? And it's going to be, it's amazing other people's eyes. So how do you approach this type of responsibility? Because it's a very big responsibility to talk about you're promoting the whole country. I mean, that's true there. I mean, what I do have an expertise in branding. If you think about Bongo Zozo and Fujio Siomisa, those are, are brands that I've, I've created. It's, a, it's a, a talent I have. And so what I've realized with, with Tanzania is that the brand is the flag. The flag is the brand. And if you see at all these events I go to, these sporting events, I've always got flags. I've got a supplier of flags from China, which I get in and I take flags to events, even when Taifa Stars qualified for AFCON in Algeria a few months ago. Those flags that were taken onto the pitch were taken on by me. I, I took the flags from UK to Algeria, and then when we won, I got onto the pitch, got those flags to the players. Because what I'm interested in, okay, so I'm interested in, in um, sports. Football, okay. Um, I'm actually really interested in athletics and marathon running. And it's in, in, indeed something that uh, East Africans, are, Tanzanians are, as East Africans, are better at than football. I know Tanzanians would prefer to be better at football, but football tends to be an upper body sport. And West Africans are built with upper bodies. And that's why West Africans generally are better footballers. Tanzanians don't want to hear that. They want to be better footballers. What we have here is very l good long distance runners. And that's to do with the savannah. The fact that we're in a savannah um, environment and for tens of thousands of years, Tanzanians have been very good at running across savannah to chase prey, for example, in, in prehistoric times. Mm -hmm. So I like to promote that. And so the way I want to promote that is because, yes, you're right, I was entrusted um, ambassador of tourism, okay, which I do... Um, by waving the flag at sports events. But the reason I do it at sports events, okay, also when I go to foreign countries, I do wave the flag in the middle of the street and I keep asking people, what is this flag? Largely because people don't know. Um, and, and I want to make the point that a lot of work needs to be done. People know the Kenyan flag. Now, the reason they know the Kenyan flag is through their sports. Their marathon runners are better, not are better, actually. It's very similar structure of bodies you know it's just that they have had more success in running people know the Kenyan flags they don't know the Tanzanian flag so much so I want to change that because the flag is the brand of Tanzania mm -hmm. so I'd like to show the link as well between sports and tourism yeah tourism is a massive revenue earner here in this country okay so if I can show the connection between sports and and tourism then more money, will, government money, will be put into sports. Because if you want uh, your Taifa Stars, the sports, the football team to succeed, if you want your runners to succeed, it needs government backing through schools. So how do you persuade them to do that? Well, you persuade them to say, look, we take the flag, we take the brand of Tanzania with our sports people. As we talked yesterday, you told me you retired when you were 45 years old. Like, that's a very, very big step, and you retired so early. 
considering in this country the retirement age is up to 65 years so and you always talk about someone making their own destiny mm-hmm. which can mean different to different people for someone it can mean having a good health for someone else it can mean having a lot of money for someone it can mean maybe having freedom like for me personally having freedom it means i've made my own destiny and when i talk about freedom i mean like financial freedom location freedom and when i look at you i can see that you have made your own destiny but everyone has their own definition so to you what does it mean to having made your own destiny that's a very good question because uh, the question um where you say look um what does it mean to you because once you've asked that question you're actually defining the parameters of the answer because the whole point of being successful isn't what other people think is successful it's what are your views on success and for me all right i approach finances slightly differently to other people okay i find many many people most people are keen on building money just having money being wealthy i prefer to spend it i to use it so most people will work 5 days a week and then rest 2 days a week at the weekend so i don't believe i don't i don't agree with that i think if you work for 3 years and then you built up some money right then spend the money and when it finishes work again you see so when i say i, re- I retired at 45 which was last year i'm 46 now that meant that i built up a an amount of money which i intend to spend now i'm quite wise with my investments i invest in bitcoin but i have shares as well um so hopefully i can just live on the the returns from those investments for the rest of my life but another thing that i look at differently from everyone else is that i don't intend to be rich when i'm old i intend to lose my marbles when i'm old right very very likely mama jessica she works with old people in an old pe- people's home and she says these people do not know their own names right What's the point of being rich if you don't know your own name? Yeah. <laughs> When I'm an old man, I don't know my old name. Just tell me I'm rich. Oh, okay. Oh, okay, I'm rich. Am I okay? Cool. I've got money, have I? Okay, cool. You know, and then uh, the worst thing as well, and I've learned this, I've seen it so many times, is if you leave money for your children. <laughs> one, they'll spend it really badly, yeah, because they don't understand the sweat that it takes to get money. But two, they will start fighting. I have seen so many families torn apart by fighting over an inheritance. I think now nah, I brought up my children to understand that there's no inheritance actually. When we were children, my mother said, "When we die, we're leaving our money to the church. You're not getting any of it." And that's really really helped me. I realized, "Oh, this is my responsibility. My money is my responsibility. I'm not getting any any." A big problem in the whole of Tanzania is that um the idea of help the idea someone's going to come and help you the idea of asking people for money go and do it yourself anyway that's that's quite the answer because as you also said also that it's how everyone else sees for example other who see that what he's saying is not from what i'm seeing yeah. someone wants to build the build the money build the money when they are 40 For example, they are 20 right now, they want to build their money when they are 40s and like, okay, but they don't know that maybe tomorrow you could die, maybe so that you yeah, die. Bob Marley said it when he said uh, money is a number, you will never be satisfied with a number. Uh, so that if you have, you think to yourself when you when you're young, oh if I have $100,000 I'll be fine. No, 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 no. It's interesting. Everyone I can ask anybody in this room, anybody. How much money do you have and how much money do you want, right? And they always say twice what they have. Same with me. If I had double the money I have, oh, I'd be so happy. No, you wouldn't. You'd have allocated it for this and this and this and this. You will never get happy. It's like followers on in, on social media. You yeah. think to yourself, if I get to five hundred thousand, that's it. I'm happy. Mm-mm. You start looking for six hundred thousand. You start looking for a million. So you will spend your entire life being unhappy, yeah. right? Unless you say, no, 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 no. It's enough. It's enough. You know, there's rich people. I know some very wealthy people. Yeah. they don't spend their money they might as well not have it right if you don't spend your money you might as well not have it yeah it's very true it's a look it's very lucky that i married um, mchaga woman because uh, 
Mama Jessica, a Chaga culture is to just hide all the money under the bed, um, which is useful because when I've uh, run out of money, I just go under the bed and uh, oh, thanks for that. Well, they have many fines. It's all my money in the first place. You know, the nice thing when you marry Chaga women is that um, when they catch you doing something you shouldn't be doing, yeah, they don't leave you. They, they, they give you a fine. It's a fine. So you pay the fine, then they hide it under the bed, then you go and take it, and you pay another fine. It's a beautiful system I've got going on, a beautiful deal. But what's nice is she will spend all of her money building a house, because Chaga, Chaga women, uh, Tanzanian people, Tanzanian women especially, want to build a house. So when I am old, poor, and don't know my name, I will be living in Mama Jessica's house. Yeah. <laughs> Shout out to Mama Jessica. Yeah. Um, you mentioned Bitcoin. So for the people that don't know, we have had conversations prior to this, and we said people just think that Bongos is traveling, but, but they don't know the logistics behind this. They think maybe it's all just free. Everything's just free, but they don't know that these, uh, as you said, you have made your money, and your money is paying for you, your travelings, your money is doing whatever you want right now. But the main, main, the main thing that you said you do right now is in your investment is Bitcoin. And later today, and I believe um, this, this episode will be out after today, so we would have already have a Connected Club, where today in Bongo Zazu would, would have talked about Bitcoin. So if you were at the event, shout out to you. And if you missed the out, listen to this right now. So, um, what sparked your interest in Bitcoin? And you said you started, I believe, was it 2017? Sorry, if I'm getting the year wrong. 2017. And how did you start your, uh, your, your crypto investment? Well, what I, I like, liked first of all about crypto was um, the freedom, the ability to uh, accept a payment from Brazil. I was... Uh, Working in business, uh, my, my business expertise is in old currencies. I, I traded wholesale old currencies on eBay. And so I had a customer in Brazil. And the problem with international bank transfers is that a, a payment from Brazil to UK would go through all these various banks. So it would take such, such a long time. And the thing is with Bitcoin is Bitcoin is a peer-to-peer -peer money transfer system. Okay, nowadays it, I'm using it as an investment and people are using it as an investment. But really what its prime use and what it was designed to do was to be a peer-to-peer -peer payment system. So that if you want to pay me and I want to pay you, why should it go past a third party? Why should it go to a bank? Yeah. Indeed, why is it anybody else's business? If I'm paying you and you're paying me, it's nobody else's business. This is our personal, yeah. And so there was a customer that, that needed to send me some money, send me $2,000 in Bitcoin. Um, and it, when it arrived, instantly, it was there. Now, I was nervous of Bitcoin. A lot of people are nervous of Bitcoin because it's quite hard to understand what it actually is. Because in reality, it's nothing. But then you come to learn about it and you come to realize that that this, the money we have in our wallet is also nothing. You know, it, it's not, it doesn't have any inherent value, like, for example, gold. Uh, you know, all diamonds will have some industrial uses. Bitcoin has no use. So what I wanted to do with this $2,000 when it came in is just cash it out and put it in my bank. But then the next day it went up 10 or 20%. It was, it, there was a surge. And so my, my $2,000 had become $2,300, something like that overnight. So I said, oh, wait, 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 now this has sparked my interest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So then I started looking on YouTube and as to what is this and to understand about it. And then the next day it dropped 15%. Or, you know, so it went from $2,000 to maybe 2400 over a course of a week. I thought, that's, that's good. That. Then it went down to 2050. I'm still up $50. It's still a good deal. But then you say, no, no, I'm, I'm really interested in this. And the thing that really inspired me to learn about Bitcoin, actually, was loss, not the gains. Mm -hmm. When you lose, I don't believe in this word loss. I believe in the word learning, yeah? So Bitcoin goes down, that's when you do the research. So that's how I got started, by, by uh, learning, yeah. L learning through loss. Learning through loss. Do you know they say W and L? You take an L, you take a W. But for you, your L is not a loss, it's a learn. It's a learn. It's yeah, a learn. that's right. Yeah. 100%. You either win or you learn. There's no such thing as loss. 100%. Now, uh, so you have different work, for example, right now. You travel, you do everything. For us, I think the people fail, for example, is the time. If you work for five days, you have the weekend, two-day weekend. But we don't 
take our time off. We even on the weekend we just try to we just work, 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 work. Yeah. And people don't know the importance of balancing your time. Yeah, yeah. So for example, for you, you were you were working. How did you balance your time of enjoying time with family with Mama Jessica? How do you like work or even the traveling, yeah. the promoting the country? How do you balance this thing, these things? Yeah, well, you just got to have a hobby because you're right. These days, it's very hard to actually take time off work because y- you know the time off work you you're on your phone, you're on your phone scrolling through your reels, and you realise I'm not I'm not actually relaxing here. So actually, I I picked up the hobby of uh, of running. I love running, um, and my son Mickey, of course, is a is a real runner. So. I like to travel to go on some runs. We've traveled to Sweden and Italy, Mickey and myself, uh, Jessica as well. The thing is, yes, I travel for work. Uh, sometimes I get sponsored for my travels, like uh, there's a money transfer app called Nala. Uh, because I have a good connection with the diaspora, um, then, and the diaspora like to send money into Tanzania, so they use this app. So he sponsors some of my trips to support the athletes because I make a lot of noise and I'm, I'm, I've become... Uh, you know, uh, visible to the diaspora. That can happen there, but um, a lot of the times I can travel. I mean, it's a, hard, it's a good question, that, because it's hard for me as well to differentiate work and, 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 and pleasure. I mean, the thing is, a lot of people in life hate their work, so they know when they're not working because they're enjoying themselves. Now, I love my work. I've never, ever, I've never worked for anybody. I've only ever worked for myself, and I've only ever loved my work. Right? Otherwise, I won't do it. Yeah, and because so much of the time I volunteer, yeah, so 70% of the time I'm doing things for free. Okay, so when you volunteer, if you don't like the job, you stop because you're not being paid. I, I, I just feel that five days working in an office is society controlling you. Someone's controlling you, and you're not. And if you're not enjoying your your, your job, then you're committing suicide. You only get one life. So, but the difference between traveling for work and traveling for pleasure sometimes is very difficult for me as well. Look, I'm hu- human like everyone else. I have the same problems. I scroll too much on my phone. Yeah. I would like to take him back to, to the Bitcoin topic because that's what you're going to talk okay. about today as well. So I think we have a little bit like of same story and about finding out about Bitcoin. I remember I personally found out a bit about Bitcoin when I had to pay someone and he asked me to pay him in Bitcoin. Yeah. So I paid them and then I forgot about it. Then the next year I had to pay someone again. So when I came back to the, to the wallet, I found like my money has doubled mm-hmm. and the balance that, that I left. So I was so surprised and then I, I wanted to learn more about it. So where do you see the future of Bitcoin going and how are you preparing for it? So the thing is with Bitcoin is I can only see it going up. I mean, there will be peaks and troughs. So it, it goes up, it gets into a manic stage where everybody jumps on and it shoots up so quickly. And when it shoots up quickly, then it can crash quickly because people like to take profits. It's quite normal. But generally, there are cycles. There's, there's boom cycles or bull markets. And then it, it can drop as well in their bear markets where it goes down. And that's just something I've come to accept. Um, and that's why I don't do things called leverage trading, where, where basically you're betting on uh, Bitcoin going up or down. Uh, if I want to bet, I can just bet against Manchester United, you know? I mean, they lose all the time. Or I can bet that Arsenal will never win the title. Can not easy. Or <laughs> 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 well, I can bet, okay, that Norwich will never get promoted again. Anyway, <laughs> things like this. I, um, so what I do, I do this thing called hodling or holding, um, where I understand that there's only 21 million Bitcoin in the world, and there's 8 billion of us in the world, and it's going to become... It's a new technology that's going to uh, overtake the world, whether people like it or not. And bear in mind, governments generally don't like Bitcoin because governments want to be involved in the transfer, right? Between you and I, they see it as their business uh, because they want to cut all companies, banks. Banks are terrified of Bitcoin because they want our business, right? And so there's going to be, a, as it gets bigger and bigger, there's going to be a lot of pressure from governments banning it, but there's one or two governments in the world, like El Salvador, the new president of Argentina, um, there's uh, some 
company, uh, Asian uh, countries as well that are pro-Bitcoin. It's basically a choice. We're at a crossroads here. Um, that countries are saying, most countries, 80% of the countries are going to say, no, we don't like Bitcoin, but there's nothing you can do to stop this revolution. So it's better that a country moves to the side of saying, okay, let's embrace this. And what I was very happy with last year is that the president of Tanzania, Mama Samir, went to the central bank of Tanzania and said, get ready for cryptocurrencies. Because why I like that so much is because generally with new technologies, we know what happens. Yeah? Kenya go first. Yeah? Kenya first through the door. I say, okay, let's accept this. Very good. And, and Tanzania last. And it hurts me so much to say, no, 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 let's be first. There's no reason why we can't be first. Let's embrace these things. I find Tanzania, one of the problems are, is that Tanzania is a very nervous, as a people, they're, they're quite scared of, of, of taking risks huh? um, because they're scared of loss. And what I'm trying to say is, look, there's no such thing as loss. Yes, there will be risks. Yes, there will be mistakes made. Let's learn from these mistakes, even in Bitcoin. Many, many Tanzanians, the biggest question I get asked or the biggest criticism I get yeah. from Tanzanians is yeah. that there are Matapele. What's, I don't know what Matapele is in English. Scammers. Scammers, thank you. Bitcoin is just a scam. That's the biggest problem you get from Tanzanians. Because what happens is that um, someone will say, look, I'll get you Bitcoin. Here, look, pay me two hundred dollars. I'll get you Bitcoin, and you will make ten thousand dollars in one week. Yeah. Ah, but that's <laughs> obviously a scam. It, you have to learn. In fact, it's a good idea to give that two hundred dollars because you will learn very, very quickly the language of scams. Yeah, so it's a bit like saying if you're trying to buy a farm, right, and someone scams you from the money, which happens. The guy didn't own the farm that he was selling. You get scammed. Does that mean that agriculture is not a business, a viable option? No, it, no. It, no you got scammed by a person, right? Yeah. That's why I'm saying start very slowly. To Tanzanians, I tell them to start very slowly in Bitcoin. People don't seem to understand. You don't need a full Bitcoin to start. You can start with 10,000 shillings. You can start with buku dierro, 1,500 shillings. And it's okay to lose that money. Yeah, because the more you lose, the more you learn. Yeah, just start slowly, gradually. Because there's nothing like uh, losing to, sp or, 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 or like you say, you went back to your wallet and you see your money's doubled. Ah, we know Tanzanian people there. No, no one could possibly go to a wallet and see it double and think, okay, I need to know what this is about. Yeah. I mean, I can, basically from what you just said is that the future of cryptocurrency, you think that it's just going to take over the world. Yeah, it's a bit like in the 1980s, if we were doing a, an interview um, in the 1980s and I was telling you about, hey, there's this thing called the internet, yeah, where you can communicate with each other and you can, and eventually it's going to come to a situation where we can do business on the internet. Yeah. A lot of people would have been skeptical. They would have said, hey, what, what, you think people are going to want to look at their screens? And if I said to you in the 1980s, look, invest in these companies like Google and, and Microsoft and, or invest in the internet, become an early adopter of the internet. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, um, you would be very wealthy. And so if you were advising a government, you were saying, look, either you're with or you're against the internet. Mm -hmm. Those countries that were with the internet, Kenya, yeah, they developed faster. The point is with Bitcoin is the technology behind it to create a peer-to-peer -peer system of, of money transfer is something that can't be ignored and it can't be banned, right? Because it's run by the people for the people. So you're either on board or you're back of the line. <laughs> so how many countries have you been to? 72. 72. 26 in Africa. 26 in Africa. Uh, you said you have different investments, uh, you invested in different stuff, shares, Bitcoin, etc, etc. And we believe in the word exposure. Okay. Well, in our episodes, most of the times we talk about exposure, saying exposure is very important. Because when you travel, you see a lot of things. Mm -hmm. So, I want you to, to tell us more about your exposure when it comes to investments. Do you think, for example, you've been to Tanzania, you've been to UK, you've been for, to, let's say, Sweden. You've seen how everyone, everyone they, have, they have different cultures. Yeah. So when it comes to investments, how, is, is there any way that it helps you make decisions like, oh, Tanzanian, they did this, but the Swedish did this. Why did they do this? Like the, the difference. Uh, yeah. When I travel, I, the most exposure I'm actually getting is, is more cultural and uh, social exposure about how people live their lives. 
But when it comes to um, investments, what I like to do, what I've learned from travel is that um, you don't put all your eggs in one basket. Yeah, you need a variety of different baskets um, so that, I mean, with travel, you get some, uh, you make some very good connections as well in terms of business. Like when I was in Japan, I met this guy that says, look, we can export um, secondhand cars to Tanzania. You know, that was a... Uh, an idea, but um, in terms of me, I'm, in terms of investments, Bitcoin is my, my riskiest investment, and in cryptocurrencies, they have much more risky investments like altcoins, which promise higher returns but higher risk. You see, you get nothing for free. Nothing is for free, which means if you're going to invest in um, something, if, if there's a high potential of reward, then there's a high potential of risk. So if you're investing in an altcoin, yeah, you could get a 100% return on your money, but you could also lose it. And that's why I stick to safe investments. So I have money in, in Google and Microsoft, Microsoft, which are some of the safest investments in the world. Tesla as well, that's a bit riskier. And when it comes to Bitcoin, what I'm looking for really is a 10% yield on my investments per year. Now, what I see so much of the time is people are looking to get rich quick you will lose your money. Understand what 10% means. If you put $100 into an investment and you paid $110 at the end of that year, that is a very good investment. And people are looking at that and say, what, you mean I get $10? <laughs> try. Go and try investing in something. Try putting it in the bank and see how much you get. Try investing in a business and see what you'll get. Yeah? And when someone's telling you that they, they'll double your money, yeah, that's probably a, a code word for you will lose your money. So what I, my biggest advice for people is, is invest very conservatively. The riskiest business for me is, is holding Bitcoin, which is quite risky. And I'm willing to take that risk. I'm willing to take the losses. Yeah. Bear in mind, I can't give financial advice and none of this is financial advice. Thank you. If you want financial advice, you, just, you should just contact your financial advisors, because we are not your financial advisors. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, when you talk about Bitcoin, you know, most people hear about Bitcoin when it's at the boom. Because when it's at the boom, that's when the media start talking about it. And people would start rushing into it, thinking like they will make millions in one month, one week, which is all a lie. And that's why they get scammed. And I really liked uh, when you talked about someone can get scammed even like when trying to buy a farm. But that doesn't mean that farming business is a scam. When you try to buy a house, but you don't have any knowledge on how to purchase a house and you get scammed, it doesn't mean real estate is a scam. So what I would advise if anyone tries to get into Bitcoin, first of all, you should just take your time and do your own research. Because you cannot just put money in anything that you don't understand. Because you either lose it or get scammed. So knowledge is very important. That's a very good point. And the thing is with um, cryptocurrency is it's not very regulated, which means it's a bit like the Wild West in terms of the leverage trading. So leverage trading is where basically you put your, your, your Bitcoin in a wallet. That wallet says to you, we will lend you money to trade Bitcoin. Trading Bitcoin is... is guessing if it goes up or down. So in Tanzania, for example, there's um, trading Forex, okay? So trading Forex, I've tried once or twice. It can get quite exciting. Um, but at the end of the day, you tend to lose, I tend to lose, because it becomes betting, it becomes gambling. There are some ways you can look at technical advice, at, uh, sorry, technical drawings. You can look at the graphs and what they're doing. Um, there are some people that can can trade like that, but 95% of people cannot trade. So the problem is with Bitcoin is you will, you get addicted to the massive gains. And then when it's not gaining massively, you think, okay, I will leverage, which means, you know, I will 10 X it 10 times it to feel that dopamine rush of the massive gains. Again, you will learn. We've all learned I've lost money and I've learned no such thing as loss, just learning. This, this one day uh, I actually was doing my own research, I was trying to see what the best investment that had a highest return in the last century, and Bitcoin came up on top. 
I think uh, I think a lesser known investment was the uh, Zimbabwe hundred trillion dollar bill. It was uh, we used to buy them at twenty cents, and they're currently traded at one hundred and fifty US dollars. It's a nice markup. That's in ten years. <laughs> that is a nice no. market. Going back to Bongo's also speaking Swahili. Um, we're coming to near to the end of the episode, but we would like to know for the people, for example, that are watching this, that I like you. They want to be like Bongo's also. They want to be well known when it comes to speaking a different language. What advice uh, would you give to individuals aspiring to learning a new language and using it professionally? Because we could say that you're using a profession. Yeah, yeah. Being, no, being told enough. to become an ambassador for tourism yeah, yeah, yeah. is a professional thing. I mean, the, the secret is to come here and, and learn it here. I tried a few lessons in, in England and didn't take off. Also, I'm not sure whether you have a choice, actually. It's something that you just have. Not the language, but if you have a love of Tanzania, I can't tell you have a love of Tanzania. There's some people that come here. For example, there's this TikToker. I'm meeting him tonight, actually. His name's Jesse. He's an English guy. Mm. Uh, he's got half a million on, on TikTok. And um, he reached out to me, but he was working in a, an NGO in Arusha. And he picked up Swahili very quickly as well. Liking the ladies again. <laughs> it's always the ladies. But I can't tell you. I can't say, look, come here and like the ladies because it's just something. It's this... Uh, Limboata, they have this, you just, you, you, you just, for some reason you say, I, I have to stay in this country, I have to marry you. <laughs> he's found himself, this Jesse guy, he's found himself a, um, a, 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 a old girlfriend from Meringa, actually, and uh, they're planning on getting married. I think I'm going to be the um, Shenga, the, uh, the uh, what's that called, the best man, I think. But that's the thing, I, I personally have... Um, at AFCON, if you remember in AFCON in Cairo, I was the only uh, white guy there. But this AFCON, there's three of us. There's, there's myself, there's Jesse, and there's a Swedish guy as well. Um, I, a lot of times when you are successful in a certain area, you can be very jealous of other people invading that area. So that's not the same with me. I, I, when I break into a, a, a boys' club, I leave the door open for others. Yeah. So this means if there's any... Um, you know, people learning Swahili and stuff, they should uh, join up with me and um, we can do some collaborations and we can just enjoy that, um, the ride of learning new words. You know, I, we can say, okay, the new word, say Wamchongo after everything. Malkoto. People laugh. Malkoto, we're using Malkoto for Christmas, Malkoto at Christmas. Laughter, 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 laughter. For anyone who wants to learn Swahili, and wants to enjoy the ride with Pongo Zozo. Yeah, just connect with me and I'll hook you up with, uh, you know, travels. We'll be going somewhere. I'll say, look, we're supporting some athlete. And, you know, if you, let's say you're from, pick a country, pick a random country. Sweden. Sweden. We've got a Swedish guy. We've got a, we can have another Swedish guy. Yeah, we go there Germany. for a, a midnight run. Germany. Germany, I go to Berlin. I'm friends with, with, with Isaac Sapetu. He's a great guy. Now, Germany, I'm going there to get the Fuvu Yamangi Meli. Be returned. Okay, so what's happened there? Yeah, this during the colonial period in Germany, nice picked country. During the German colonial period, the Germans mm, killed uh, one of the rebel leaders, and his name was Mangi Meli, and they took his skull to Germany and put it in a um, in a museum. Mm -hmm. And he's a Chaga guy, a very old man who's the grandson of this guy, and he wants compensation. He wants the the, the skull back and compensation. But the problem is it's hard for him to go to Germany. It's not hard for me to go to Germany. So I'm going to meet him over Christmas when I'm going to Moshi to get counted for their, for their annual census because, of course, Mama Jessica is from Moshi. When I'm going there, I'm meeting this guy and I'm saying, look, I will take your case to Germany. And when I'm there, I'm friends with Isaac Sepetu. Isaac Sepetu is Wemer Sepetu's brother. We're good friends there. Now, let's say there's some German, white German guys who want to learn um, Swahili. I'll say to them, look, do you want to join our campaign? Come join our campaign to get this, this. So the point is, I've got some very exciting plans. We're doing something in every country. And if you want to come along, come along. Come along. Yeah. Reach I, learned that, I actually learned that um, welcome from Tanzania. 73 countries in the world I've been to. And you ask me, people ask this, who, who are the most beautiful women in the world? Tanzania. Right? Nope. Up. Mm -mm. 
Nasema ukweli, chukia or si chukia, I am telling you the truth. Ethiopians are the most beautiful Africans, in, even in Africa. Japanese women, I'm sorry, Tanzania are up there in the top five. You can be angry, but I'm telling you the truth. You want me to tell you the truth, or you want me just to please you? Okay, but ask me this question. What is it that Tanzania has? What does Tanzania have? That is number one in the world. Now, it has two things that are number one in the world, yeah? Now, I'm, I, I know I'm, I'm ambassador of tourism. I should say I has the best landmarks and the best mountains. It's in the top five, once again. But the best things that Tanzania has, and you know I'm telling the truth now. Because if I wasn't telling the truth, I'd say they're number one for everything, yeah? For food, they're number three, number two, you know? They're, they're some of this, this Vietnam's an amazing. But number one in the world, Tanzania has the best welcome. And it also has the, it doesn't translate well in, in English, humanity. Utu. Yeah, the, the humanity. You know, a Tanzanian will, uh, he will, he will, when you have small problems, uh, small problems, he'll abandon you with your small problems. But when you have big problems, yeah, and I mean big problems, they will save your life. Like, and I mean, when you, when, when someone dies, when your father dies, yeah, you will be saved by a Tanzanian, you know. And that is Utu. That's humanity, that one there. So, yeah, there's the, 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 the naked truth about Tanzania. So, actually, uh, the first day I saw Bongo Zozo was my mom. She lives in Australia. She tried to send to me a, a video of you talking about dual citizenship and the importance of it. So, I saw you talking about it and I was very impressed with the way you were trying to explain and the importance of it. It was through social media. But I really want to know your real story. Like, how did you become so popular? As I said, like... Almost everyone in the streets know you. They know okay. your face. Okay. 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 So it um, started at the AFCON game between Tanzania and Senegal. Okay. In 2019. I like to travel. I like to travel for a purpose. I was in, actually at that game that we qualified for AFCON for the first time in 39 years. I then said, well, well, there's a game between Tanzania and Kenya, actually, at AFCON. That's the one I want to go and see. Mm. But I'm there, so we went to see, I went to see the opening game. And we lost to Senegal. But afterwards, uh, what happened, actually, when the national anthem was being sung, you see, I sing very, very loudly. Yeah? And so Supersport picked up this white guy with a big beard singing this, the national anthem so loudly. So Miladao saw that video and, and said to his journalists there, Go and interview that Amzungu. Yeah. So after the match, we're being interviewed. Now, I'm a positive person, okay? I always see the positive. Because we lost 2-0 to Senegal. So everyone's, all the, all the post-match interviews were, oh, well, we lost to team, the bouncer. We were taking on the bouncer and this. <laughs> I didn't care. I said, of course, we're going to lose to Senegal. Yeah, I don't care. We, it's the first time in 39 years we're here. That's what I like. And I love Tanzanians. I said, Tanzanians have fujo. Hmm? Fujo meaning mayhem. Mm -hmm. Then I thought about that word. That's too much. I have to soften that word. So I said Fujo Siomisa. Harmless mayhem. So when people saw that, they said, this guy knows and loves Tanzania. That's what I was talking about. When you're learning the language of Tanzania, the, ones that, the people that learn Swahili fluently are the ones that love Tanzanian people. Sure. Because Fujo Siomisa was a word that has never been said before, but it made total sense. And of course... Tanzanians are very open to new words. The language picks up new words from different languages all through its history, right? So that word became a, a, a word that was said even in Parliament. People, the, the, the people in Parliament were saying, ah, food you see me, the harmless mayhem. Yeah. And so that started me off. Now, the thing is in social media, and this is a lesson for social media. Everybody who wants to succeed in social media, you've got to constantly be rebranding. You've got to come up with new stuff. I couldn't... I wouldn't be around today, five years later, saying Fujio Siomise, although I do say that all the time. That's not my only trick. I've been learning new things. So as well as being a fan of Typha Stars, people then, I was, did videos with Mama Jessica, and people said, oh, this guy lives with this woman for 24 years, and they've been through some kind of breakup and divorce, and now they're living like an African style. Oh, we like this, and they like Mama Jessica. And then I moved over to traveling, vlogging in Swahili. Nobody does that. And then... What you point there is dual citizenship. So what happens, my biggest following are the diaspora. Okay, so these people watching the diaspora, like you say, you were sent a video by your, 
by a relative in Australia. That makes total sense. I'll tell you why, because I used to go to those games in Benin and Madagascar, and I used to live stream in, in, from the stand. So that a, a supporter in, in Australia, there's no way they could see that. How, how can I see Tanzania versus Benin in Benin? Oh, when well, you go to Bongo Zozo's Facebook live stream, and my live stream at some point had 15,000 viewers, and the comments were coming in, we're watching from Saudi Arabia, we're watching from South Africa. And that's actually why that money transfer app, Nala, they sponsor a lot of my trips because my following are the diaspora. And even when I was speaking with um, Mze Jacob today, he was talking about, look, we want you to speak more about the, with the diaspora. And another reason, of course, is because I have an issue with dual citizenship. This, it, it, it's an issue that I'm on the side of the diaspora because my children were Tanzanian citizens. Now they've turned 18. They've had their citizenship taken away by doing nothing. And it's a little strange to me, and I'm willing to stand up for them because I'm not a political person. I do not get involved in politics, right? I, just generally, I'm not a, a, a party person. You'll see I don't support Singba or Younger. Yeah? I don't like to put myself in one group over another group. I'm, a, I'm a, a unity person for the world. Okay, So I never get involved in politics for that reason, Okay, party politics. But if there's something that is affecting my children that's a political issue, for example, dual citizenship, I will stand up and say, look, this is unfair. Not only is it unfair on my children to be stripped of their citizenship, their birthright, right? The fact that their mother is actually Tanzanian, you know, and that Mickey was born in Aga Khan in Dar es Salaam. Yeah, I'm Toto, I'm Gini. He's done nothing other than turn 18, and now, because he didn't reject his British citizenship, he's been stripped of his Tanzanian citizenship. One, that's unfair, so I'll stand up against that. But number two, you are losing sports people. Yeah, when Typhus Stars go and play against these other teams, when we were in Benin, there were players there that had never been to Benin. Their grandmother was from Benin. Yeah, you're, ben you're Beninian now. Yeah, yeah. We, are, we will lose. You see it all the time. You see these sports people being offered another citizenship. And I'm talking black Tanzanian people. We're not talking, I understand dual citizenship has a major problem because Tanzanians are quite scared of foreigners, right? For whatever reason, I mean, you know, 70 years ago this happened. 70 years ago, we, Britain were at war with Germany. I'm not scared of any German. Yeah, things have changed. But I understand people are nervous about dual citizenship here because they think that Chinese people are going to come and, and buy all the land. Okay? That's a different issue. I'm talking about Tanzanian black people losing their citizenship rights and losing the ability to play for our, our national team Ah, uh, well, we won't, we, we, we won't advance uh, very quickly. So that's why the diaspora are very interested in what I've got to say. And that's why it's nice. Okay, today I'm doing an interview in English. I'm uh, hoping that they are going to enjoy that. <laughs> it's an interesting part of it. And guys, uh, that, com that sums up the whole episode. We are here with Bongo Zozo. We talked about uh, how his come up came about. It's the women. So if you want to learn the language, the summary is love the women there. And we also talked about his venture in Bitcoin. We also talked about um, how he became Bongo Zozo. And we also talked about how he became an ambassador for tourism. But all in all, for what I took in is that losing, is, there's no such thing as a loss. It's learning. You win, you either win or you learn. So take that in. Take it in, and as he's also said, opportunities just you know you don't have to be chasing opportunities every day or volunteer for something that that makes sense. We are very keen on just saying, Bongozozo, I'm gonna bring you this bracelet, uh, uh, give me 2000, but so you could give it to Bongozozo for free, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then it will leave a much bigger impact on him. Be like, oh, yeah. he gave it to me for free, yeah. So one day we'll just look for him, we're like, oh, let me just call Monty, and yeah, like, yeah. he gave me the, this. No, the I was shocked even today at the uh, yesterday when I checked into my hotel, yeah, I said to them, give me an upgrade, give me your best room here. Right? And they said, they, they said well, no, you have to pay for an upgrade. I said, okay, well, I won't make any videos then. Hush. You're missing out there. You know, you've got a free room there. You understand I'll video it, but whatever. It's, it's, a, it's just a simple example then. It's a simple if example. If they gave it to you, that means they gave it. Like, I would, oh, I would be obliged. It would be on, this, on my story. I'd be obliged. I'd be doing videos then. I've got no obligation. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So take your time. Volunteer for things. Volunteer. Be out there. Yeah. Be out there always doing things. It's not about the, the short-term gains. Be out there showing yourself as a person.
simple example that we don't like to talk about ourselves, but for example, for us, uh, uh, we talked about monetary thing. We get money. We have not made a single penny. Of course, we have, yeah. I we have know like, about views. Yeah, we're about twelve episodes in. We have yeah. not made any money, yeah. but. The more we do, the more opportunity we got. Opportunity to connect with Bongo Zozo. There you go. There you we go. I'm very impressed with your setup here. I should do more of this. I should have, and not necessary equipment, but you've inspired me to put out more in my production in terms of all my editing. It's mm. taking time away from what I'm good at, which is, is is putting my face and and, mm-hmm. and, and doing things. Yeah. I need to find. So um, there's an opportunity here. If um, someone knows how to edit Premiere Pro, I'm looking for an editor to travel the world with me. But she has to be a gorgeous woman. Not uh, a man. Just a gorgeous woman. Well, uh, all, all women are gorgeous. Just a Tanzanian woman. Yeah, yeah. but this is the problem. All the Premier Pros, these people watching and thinking, yeah, I know Premier yeah, Pros. Yeah, like Tamaro. Yeah, all when you're Sura Zito. Yeah. Atao, Apa. Yeah, what it's in my head, Fusa, you know? Like any Sura Zito, Sura Zito. Yeah. But volunteer for things, guys. The more you volunteer, you leave an impact on someone, and that person will always remember you. Uh-huh. We. We are volunteering, doing this, yeah, we're doing this, but yeah. we have started Connectors Club where people are connecting. Fantastic. We connect yeah. with Bongo I've got to say well done on that one. You're doing, I'm very, very impressed. I, I was you. not expecting this. The yeah. idea of, of saying, let, let's do an event, you know, and what happens if nobody turns up? It's terrifying. Mm-hmm. It's, it's embarrassing. Mm-hmm. I don't care. If, we, if no one turns up, then we've learned, learned something. We haven't lost anything, we've learned something. Learned something. Well done. Thank you, Thank you very Thank much. You so much. But uh, that was Bongo Zozo. Bongo Zozo, any last words to them? Uh, to put on it, but in which language? English, eh? Sweet. Okay. Uh, okay, so. To put on one journey. Mimi mm-hmm. coach, what is it? Mimi coach, what is it? One day, I like a comment or subscribe. Yeah, okay. Mimi Bongo Zozo! Subscribe now, share your video. Oh, yeah, MO, make your own MYOD. Ah, uh,